Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and uh, welcome to another half hour of Libertarian Conversation. Now tonight, we've got not one, but two candidates for borough president in the upcoming New York City municipal elections. I, of course, am the Libertarian nominee for Manhattan borough president, and with me tonight is Gary Popkin, the Libertarian and Reform Party candidate for Brooklyn borough president. Now, uh, Gary, maybe you can start by telling me how you managed to bag both those prizes, both the Libertarian and the Reform Party nominations. Oh, yes, well, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, Joseph. And um, I will tell you that um, at the uh, Libertarian nominating convention in Astoria this spring, I made a most eloquent speech about why this was the year and this was the race that, we, that the Libertarian Party needed to contest. Um, as it turned out, the uh, body that I was speaking to uh, was not authorized to give me the nomination. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got the nomination somehow later on. Um, can, I, can I tell you why this, I'll tell you why this is the year and this is the race after okay. I tell you As how I bagged the other nominations. I, tell yeah, you how I, I, don't, I don't really give a darn how you got the Reform Party nomination because we're libertarians after all. So okay. uh, tell me why this is the year and this is the time and all that fun stuff. Okay. Um, the... Uh, uh, incumbent, the incumbent borough president uh, got himself into a lot of hot water. Um, he, uh, he has angered a lot of people in Brooklyn and so this is a, a great opportunity to take on, to take on the incumbent. Um, the, uh, the most his most dramatic mistake was his involvement with uh, Bruce Ratner, his collusion with Bruce Ratner and uh, his attempt to take by eminent domain a, uh, a, a thriving and still up and coming neighborhood, Prospect Heights, for the purposes of, for purpose of building an, um, a basketball arena and 17 very high rise buildings. Now um, it became quickly clear that uh, Bruce Ratner was not a sports fan and was not much interested in the arena. He was just kind of throwing in the arena as a sop. But uh, he wanted he wanted the, that land he wanted the land taken for him for the 17 buildings. Okay, now um, the issue of eminent domain has always been uh, a pretty major one for us libertarians. Uh, maybe you could very quickly explain to our viewers who don't fully understand it just what is eminent domain? How does it work? And how come we're opposed to it? Well, eminent domain has a long and um, a long and uh, most uh, inelegant history. Um, uh, a thousand years ago, the king owned all land and could just take whatever he wanted. Um, from the year 1215 on, when the nobles cornered King John and forced him to uh, sign Magna Carta, the king and the nobles owned all the land and could take whatever they wanted. Even as late as uh, even as late as the, um, the late 18th century, when the, uh, the United States Constitution was written, if you look carefully at the wording of the Fifth Amendment, it says that, nor shall, nor shall private property be taken for public use except with just compensation. So even late in the 18th century, it was still assumed that government could take private property for public use, but it was a great leap forward that just compensation was required. The land couldn't just be stolen. In any case, eminent domain is a relic from the days before Magna Carta. And uh, what has been going on in the last 50 years is that governments have been expanding the definition of public use and taking land willy-nilly from private people, from private owners, and giving it to other private owners. Um, there was uh, in Michigan uh, 50 years ago that uh, infamous uh, Pole Town case where an entire neighborhood was taken by a municipality and given to a private developer. Okay, but the libertarian position on eminent domain is that it doesn't matter who's taking it. If they're taking it, they're initiating force against you and uh, that, that's not on. That's not cricket. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. If someone came, if, 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 if some, uh, some thug some mugger came to your house with a gun and said, get out, get out, I'm taking this, I'm taking this house from you, I'll give you $20,000 for it, 
uh, he would be in prison if he was caught and convicted. But if the borough president comes to your house with a gun and says, get out, I'm taking this, I'll give you $20,000 for it, oh, he's a hero. And so um, uh, whether it's a government thug or a, uh, a mugger, it's still theft. Okay, so if you get to be borough president, which I sincerely hope, then what are you going to do to, uh, to stop these depredations on the part of the government? Oh, I will terminate them in Brooklyn to the extent of my ability. Um, for one thing, I plan to save the next mayor, whoever he is. Or, she, or, our candidate is Audrey Silk. Oh, right, that's right, that's right, whoever he or she is, well, whoever she is. I'm going to save her a billion dollars off the next budget by opposing the waste of taxpayer money to build a basketball arena in Brooklyn. If somebody wants to build something in Brooklyn, let him use his own money. Don't send me the bill. Okay, and um, will you uh, do anything to circumvent the... Uh efforts of uh, the city council or whoever uh, might have a hand in it to um, take away people's property? Well, you know that uh, the, uh, the borough presidents have very little power in, the, uh, in law. They appoint some, uh, they appoint uh, members to uh, commissions. But they have a bully pulpit, a bully pulpit, and um, I would certainly use that. I would certainly speak out and um, Use, uh, use the power of my office, the, the media power of my office, to uh, lean on the city council members from Brooklyn mm -hmm. to do what is best for and what is freedom best, in Brooklyn. What is best for Brooklyn these days? What does Brooklyn need, and uh, how would a uh, libertarian approach be best for meeting those needs? Well, of course, the libertarian approach is, is uh, always very simple and very boring. It's always the same solution to every problem. Every, every public policy issue is answered the same way. How can we get the decision making out of the hands of politicians and into the hands of individuals? Uh, that's real power to the people. That is power to the people. How can we get individuals to manage their own lives according to their own resources and their own preferences rather than have politicians manage our lives. And we can apply that same boring principle to every, every public policy issue. There are lots of people who like politicians to govern our lives. Oh gosh, it yes. It gives There's them control them. over us. That's right. Yeah, now that's something that I'm curious about. I've always been curious about it. There was a time when Americans were known for their spirit of independence, for standing up to anybody who oppresses them, or oppressed them, or tried to. But these days, it seems like Americans, especially Americans in big cities, it seems to me, have become so passive. If if a government official were to come at us with a red hot poker and say, "I'm going to jam this up your butt." We would just bend over and grab onto something. Well, not libertarians, but it's true that, um, that, that people have fallen for the lies of politicians for the last 50 years, the last 70 years. Um, politicians offering free this and free that, uh, free housing, free transportation, free, pub, uh, free uh, public education free education, free health care. But you look at those services that are provided by government and Every one of them is of low quality and very expensive. People have nothing but complaints about public education. Well, the people in the, 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 the parents of children in the worst public schools in Brooklyn. And nothing, you hear nothing but complaints about public housing, from the tenants of public housing, how poor the quality is and how expensive it is. Okay, so what's the libertarian approach then to uh, improving those bad schools and that bad housing? Well, the bad housing. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up housing. Um, Brooklyn has a dire need for housing. And um, I base my housing policy on this idea that where, wherever housing is built in Brooklyn, whatever level of quality and price the housing is built, it creates more housing for everyone. Like let's say for example that how that new housing is built only at the highest level of quality and price, only luxury housing. Well, that creates new housing from which people will, people will move from older housing up into the new housing and create vacancies at that level 
into which other people can move up. That's generally and, the way it works. And so any housing built anywhere in Brooklyn creates more housing choices for everyone. I'd like to see a vacancy rate of 5%. Um, 5% uh, vacancy rate on apartments in Brooklyn because um, at that level, at that vacancy rate, landlords become desperate for tenants. Um, in the 20s and 30s, we had a vacancy rate like that. In the 1920s and 1930s, we had a vacancy rate like that. And landlords used to give the first month free. To, they were so desperate for tenants. And uh, people moved often to take advantage of the first month. And I heard stories of very poor families who used to move every two and three months to take advantage of that one free month. It was easier to move than to paint. And so if we had that kind of condition in Brooklyn again, landlords would be after tenants. They would look to tenants as something desirable to hold on to rather than something to chase away as they now do. Okay, but there are so many obstacles laid in front of uh, developers, are, are there not? And it's often, oftentimes those obstacles are laid by the municipal government. Now, oh. why is that, and how can we put a stop to it? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, we, we put a stop to it by electing a libertarian borough president. But why is that? I guess because it sounds good if you don't listen carefully or if you don't, uh, you don't think beyond the, uh, the, the next consequence. Um, one candidate for borough president has said that he will demand of every builder Every builder who wants to build an apartment building in Brooklyn, he will demand that 40% of the apartments be affordable housing, be subsidized housing. And another candidate, not to be outdone, will say, wait, I'll demand that 45% of the apartments be subsidized housing. And another candidate will say, wait, wait, I'll demand that 50%. And then what does the builder say? Well, forget this. Forget well, this hassle. I'm anyone, going to Jersey City. Has anyone bothered to point out that these politicians are in all probability lying through their teeth, that they couldn't possibly enforce such a thing? And even if you were the worst kind of goody-goody socialist, you wouldn't be able to get that through. These people are not telling the truth, are they? Oh, right. That's right. They've been lying for 50 years. And it's not just a matter of... It's not just a matter of getting the right person in, that uh, if we just get the right person elected, then somehow public housing will become a renter's paradise. Um, obviously not so. No. Um, the, the voters have been getting the right person in for 50 years, and it's been nothing but lies and disappointments. And um, it just astonishes me that, uh, that candidates after 50 years of failure in one area or, or another, let's say public housing, 50 years of government failure, candidates are still offering the same prescription. Okay. Just astonishing. But uh, there are an awful lot of people who um, find, find it hard to afford housing. What would be the libertarian approach to creating housing that, uh, that these folks could afford? Can you count on the free market to do that? Absolutely. The, um, the free market will provide what customers want and what customers are willing to pay. Um, I would like to make Brooklyn builder friendly instead of builder hostile. Instead of being confrontational with builders and saying, you have to get permission from me before you can do something with your property, I would like to, to make, make Brooklyn um, inviting to builders, because once you do that, builders will build and build and overbuild. They always overbuild. And then once that happens, they become desperate for tenants. Right. And uh, I suppose you would apply much the same solution to, uh, to education. Is that correct? You've talked quite a lot about public education. And of course, public education, the concept is anathema to many libertarians. But um, what would your approach be to improving the state of education in Brooklyn? Ah, um, now, now my approach um, might be considered um, not a libertarian approach by some libertarians, but I have a, uh, a, a trick up my libertarian trick up my sleeve. Let me tell you what my campaign position is, and then I'll tell you how a reporter interpreted it. Um, the, um, the Department of Education this year is spending thirteen thousand dollars a year on every child in public school. Uh, the budget is fourteen and a half billion, something like that, fourteen and a half billion this year, and uh, there are one point one million 
public school children, probably 300,000 of them in Brooklyn. So I say this, the $13,000, to Brooklyn parents, I'll make this offer. You take your child out of public school and relieve the taxpayer of that $13,000 a year burden. And we'll give $6,500 to the parent and $6,500 back to the hard-pressed Brooklyn taxpayer. Um, and we'll see how many accept the offer. We've got 300,000 public school children in Brooklyn. Um, maybe 10,000 will accept the offer the first year, maybe 20,000. Maybe 50,000 children will accept the offer. That's hundreds of millions of dollars of saving to the taxpayer. And I want to give that money back to hard-pressed Brooklyn taxpayers. Um, I'd like to lower the sales tax rate in Brooklyn so that everything that every Brooklynite buys is cheaper. We'd like to lower the real estate tax in Brooklyn, lower traffic fines in Brooklyn, lower sanitation fines in Brooklyn, so that all of those savings, all of those tax savings can be passed on to every Brooklynite, not just Brooklynites who pay income tax, but every Brooklynite who pays all kinds of taxes into the coffers in Manhattan. Okay, and then on that uh, encouraging and uplifting note, I'm going to take a quick little break here just to remind our viewers that if you need to know a little more about the Libertarian Party and Libertarian principles in general, and I don't dare say quite a few of you do need to learn a little more about them, um, you can always go to the website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. That is www.manhattanlp.org. And there you will find um, not only information about the local chapter, but you will find links to the National Libertarian Committee and to the State Committee, where you will learn even more about the principles of libertarianism, how you can join the party, how you can help in upcoming election campaigns, and how you can spread the word to your fellow citizens. Once again, that is www.manhattanlp.org. And back to the fray now. Um, you and I have in common that we are both running for borough president. I'm running in Manhattan. You're running in Brooklyn. We seem to um, agree that the job of borough president doesn't really entail a lot of work, but it is a bully pulpit. So uh, I've already figured out how I'm going to use it when I'm elected borough president of Manhattan. How are you going to use the bully pulpit when you are president of Brooklyn? What well, issues will you attack most fiercely? Oh, well, housing. Housing is a, uh, as, as we've already discussed, housing is a very serious issue in Brooklyn. I don't know if it's a very serious issue in Manhattan. I try not to pay uh, attention to Manhattan except when we, except when Brooklynites are oppressed by Manhattanites. Um, so housing is a very serious issue and I would try to make Brooklyn housing friendly, builder friendly and landlord friendly instead of builder hostile. Um, because you chase builders away. Builders don't have to build in New York City. If you don't make New York an inviting place, don't make Brooklyn an inviting place for builders to build, they'll just go and build somewhere else. So build in Jersey City. What do they need us for? So, uh, so build, building, um, so housing would be, be my, my main, would be an important issue. And um, I would uh, use the, um, use the, uh, the, the media power of the office to let the Brooklynites know when their elected representatives are not representing their interests. And this goes for the, the members of the city council from Brooklyn and also the members of the state legislature, also the uh, members of the state senate and the state assembly, because there's a lot that goes on in Albany that um, affects Brooklyn very directly. It's not just uh, City Hall. Do you feel that a lot of the uh, current office holders in Brooklyn are uh in fact, acting against the best interests of the borough? Oh, yes. Um, uh, there, was, uh, there was recently a, a piece of legislation that was going to adversely affect uh, residences older than 50 years, 50 years or older. Now, uh, I was going to, to lower the market value of those residences by making them harder to sell. Um, the legislation was going to require the buyers of such residences to go through, to jump through extra hoops. So the borough with the oldest buildings, the borough with the oldest housing stock would be most adversely affected. And that, of course, is Brooklyn. Um, Queens and Staten Island are new boroughs. 
And um, of course, Manhattan is always rebuilding. There's hardly anything in Manhattan, never mind 50 years old. There's hardly anything that's 50 minutes old. Yeah, they in Manhattan. say Manhattan will be a great city if we ever get it finished. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and so Brooklyn has this huge housing stock of residences older than 50 years. And um, yes, I, was I saw them in uh, arsenic and old lace. I was astonished to discover that the leading council members, the council members who were pushing this legislation the hardest, were council members from Brooklyn. Well, what was their rationale for crying out loud? Ah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what the rationale of any council member is. But they well, just, yes, most of them are remarkably but they, stupid. But they, well, well, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. But um, it must be something in the air in the city council chambers. It must be something in Manhattan. When they go to the city council chambers in Manhattan, it must be the air in Manhattan that makes them behave like Manhattanites. Okay. So I, I plan to stay out, of, uh, stay out of city hall and stay out of the uh, city council chambers. Okay. So um, if you're elected borough president, is this Ratner project going to go through? Well, it's not going to go through on the taxpayer's dime, uh, as I said, I will, I will say I'm going to save Audrey almost a billion dollars off the budget by uh, opposing the use of taxpayer money. And uh, whatever I can do to stop, the, uh, stop uh, the abuse of eminent domain, I will do. Now, unfortunately, with the Ratner Project, um, Bruce Ratner has already bought a lot of properties, uh, I think, by frightening property owners with the threat of eminent domain. You know, I think that the negotiation between Ratner and the property owners was not uh, an, an, an arm's length negotiation. The property owners were at, a, were at a severe disadvantage because if they didn't take Ratner's offer, then who knows what eminent domain damage would be coming down the pike. So they were really not what we would call willing sellers. They were really under the sword or under the gun and uh, a lot of that damage has already been done. Ratner has acquired a lot of property uh, just by buying it. Um, well, if you call that buying it. Okay. So, um, so the, the eminent domain issue is now a little peculiar. Um, if, if I was able to stop the use of eminent domain for acquiring the remaining properties, then Ratner has got a whole lot of condos, a whole lot of condos that he bought, and um, a whole lot of uh, small stores along Flatbush Avenue that he bought. Okay. Well, um, now uh, on that hopeful note, um, let's uh, step away just a moment for, from uh, the local issues and maybe give our viewers a little bit better idea of what we are and what we stand for, we libertarians. Can you um, give our viewers just a quick thumbnail description of what libertarianism is all about? Because I have a feeling a lot of them haven't even heard of it. Ah, um, libertarianism is based on the proposition that you own yourself. If you don't own your body, then who does? Um, libertarian, uh, libertarianism is also based on um, the uh, on the belief that it is wrong to use force to accomplish uh, social or economic ends. And of course, the, the biggest user of force is government when they force you to do things you don't want to do or prevent you from doing things you do want to do and take 50% of your daily bread. Okay, and so when we um, look at um concepts like taxation, property taxes, for example, or eminent domain, then we have to say that um, if property taxes exist, and if the government can penalize you for not paying property taxes, then in effect, they're saying you don't really own your property. You merely lease it from the government, and um, they get to tell you how you can use it. And if you don't use it properly, or if you don't pay the, uh, the taxes, i.e. the rent on it, then they can confiscate it. Or the, uh, the tribute. That's right. Tribute, yes. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's probably tribute. a better word. That's right. The, that's right. The government lets you use 
the property that you supposedly own as long as you pay the tribute, as long as you pay the, uh, the required tribute. Actually, failure to pay the tribute results in loss of, uh, loss of uh, the property. Well, you're, you're evicted from the property that the government was allowing you to, to use. Right, and the concept of eminent domain goes hand in hand with, with that uh, very old-fashioned and I think discredited idea that your property doesn't really belong to you. It can be taken from you by the government at, at the government's whim. Uh, belongs to the king. Right. Or the nobles. Or belongs in this to case to the city. Mm -hmm. um, so what can the uh, borough president do to try and um, get the concept of self-ownership across to um, not only his constituents, but to the government as a whole who are going to just keep on abusing us if we don't do something about it? Well, the borough president does appoint members of boards. And, um, uh, and I would certainly um, attempt to appoint a libertarian to every position on every board. And then there's also the, um, the bully pulpit, um, just talking and talking and pointing out the consequences of believing the same lies over and over again for 50 years. Okay, and uh, we are also, you and I both, in a very comfortable position in that we do not belong to either the Demoblican or the Republican parties, so we don't really have to go along in order to get along. We are, both of us, free and independent candidates who can um, work without fear or favor and just do what we think is right rather than doing what we think is expedient. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, that's right. I, um, uh, my, my positions are clear uh, and uh, uncompromised. Okay, same here. And um, so I guess it only remains for the uh, good people of Brooklyn to go out and vote for you for borough president, Gary Popkin, and, to vote, and the good folks of Manhattan must vote for me, Joseph Dobrian, as their borough president. And of course, both need to vote for Audrey Silk for mayor of New York. And then, possibly, we just might be on our way to good city government. And on that note, we'll wrap things up here. Tune in next week for another edition of Hardfire.